Oh. And then she ran away. Then she ran away. Ah, as they do. As yeah. they do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Boxman. Hey, how y'all doing? Good, Good, how are you? Good. Hey. Dealing with all kinds of domestic issues. This class is a nice break from that. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know what your home lives are, but people here are getting real sick of being trapped indoors with each other. <laughs> My, I was just uh, saying, I think the the devices around us have started to shut down. I've had students who uh, had like their microphone just totally fail on their computer. Oh no! I had my hot water heater fail last week. Oh, oh that, it just was yeah. like nope. Yeah. It just gave up. Yeah. Yep. It turns out uh, my Hanukkah miracle of my hot water heater that was twenty two years old had. <laughs> to come to an end eventually. And it, <laughs> 20, 20 years, it's not gonna last much more. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been sort of waiting. I was like, let's just see what happens. And it turns out the failure point was it just rusting through the bottom <laughs> and starting to spit water out. And I was like, oh, I can solve this. <laughs> wow. wow. Well, should we get started? Let's talk about yes. some formal geometry. Yeah, all right. So <laughs> here's the story with today. Every day there's a new story. So um, again, there's no slides for this because everything we did last time and this time is related to stuff in some conference presentation Keenan gave and he just posted a video for his class of that conference presentation and told them to watch it. I don't think that conference presentation is appropriate, not even clearly relevant. The reading that was posted for Tuesday, I think is interesting. I went over the, what I thought was interesting from it last time in class, but it's not terribly relevant to either the written assignment or the coding assignment, which is a whole different way of thinking about conformal geometry. And so <laughs> I've literally spent the last month to two months maybe even building up to today, <laughs> just trying to understand, because I don't know this stuff, but I didn't before, and I've had to kind of teach it to myself and understand what was going on. And it builds on a whole lot of material from really advanced coursework, from graduate level coursework on um, Riemann surfaces and Cauchy-Riemann equations and a lot of complex analytic geometry. And if you haven't had that stuff, I had some of that stuff in grad school and haven't looked at it since. Um, and I know most of you guys haven't had that stuff. If you've had a class in complex variables, you'll have seen some of this. But trying to digest it all and put it all together and synthesize everything and get it to an understandable form in a form where you can do the homework assignments and the, um, the coding assignment is, is a bit of a challenge. So my goal is to try to go through the written, the chapter, seven in his text, in Keenan's the course notes, and just get us to the point where we could understand the algorithms that are presented in the last like two pages of that chapter. There's a whole lot in that chapter. It's super, super dense. But I think now that I've stared at it for several months, I think it is possible in the next hour and 15 minutes or so to get it to the point where it might be understandable to you guys. If you ask me too many super technical questions, this is a disclaimer. This is all new to me too. You can easily stump me. So, you know, I'll do my best. Feel free to ask questions, please. Um, just a warning. <laughs> uh, my own understanding of some of the stuff is a little bit shaky and I hope I don't trip myself up, but uh, I think I've got most of this down. We're here for you. <laughs> We're here for you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. The like inside baseball, um, you know, kind of comment for the students is that, you know, this is an area that's actually super, super relevant in computer graphics, particularly in things like 2D animation. Um, and I, I find this to be one of those, in, one of these instances of like the emperor's new clothes kind of thing where, like, I think there's a lot of people in graphics that talk about conformal geometry a little bit the way that um, 
that Keaton talks about it, which is like kind of like over like weirdly overly technical in the way that makes them like look smart and intimidating and yet is probably actually a mechanism to hope that people don't ask them technical questions about it because it's like not a super deep knowledge. <laughs> um, and like, there's very few people on the computer science side that I think have had the classes that Prof Bachman was just mentioning. So like, it's something to really think about, like, especially if you go on to look at any of the computer graphics papers in this area, like how people talk about the math, I think, tells you a lot about their like research philosophies and just like how they approach difficult subject matter and it can be very interesting from like a human perspective so just something to kind of keep in mind that there's like practitioners on the computer science side of this stuff that like are in the same boat that we all, all are in right now which is basically trying to make sense of this like kind of esoteric map in order to solve cool problems but from an outsider's perspective so yeah yeah, I mean, and 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 this is actually something that happens a lot. So, so I've hinted at my background a little bit. I I have a PhD in topology. Most of the research papers I've written have been in topology, and specifically in finding topological analogs for geometric structures. So, but it's the same kind of thing that Catherine was just talking about, where most of the people working in my area of topology don't actually know the geometry all that well, and that includes me, unfortunately. We just we kind of know the major theorems, but not necessarily the proofs of the theorems, because we're just looking for topological structures for which the conclusions of those theorems are still true. Right? So we're looking for things that behave in the same way as the geometry, but we don't understand the underpinnings, the technical parts of the geometry all that well. And actually, this class has been great for me to teach, because I've had to learn a lot of the geometry stuff and fill in some of those gaps that I haven't known. So. You know, my background is looking at topological analogs for these geometric structures, and this class is all about looking at discrete analogs for these geometric structures, and they're slightly different. So, all right, let's jump into it and see, see how far I can get, and hopefully I'll get through it. Um, oh, and just to, to warn you all, um, next week, Catherine tells me, is clinic week at MUD, where there are no classes. So we're just going to follow that. And um, so this is technically our last week of classes. And um, we can't really ask you to do more than one more assignment. So I think we'll cover everything today that you'll need to do the assignment, which means even on Thursday, we won't cover any new material. We could just use that time for um, just like basically extended office hours to help you with that assignment. So today, hopefully will be it. If I don't finish today, the nice thing about that is we have Thursday also and I can just I don't feel like I'm quite as rushed today because if I don't finish, I'll just finish up on Thursday. Okay. All right. So let's jump into it. Um, we talked last time about what the word conformal means. So a conformal mapping versus an isometry is a, is a weaker notion. So again, you can all hopefully see my iPad screen still. If we have some surface, like just some sort of deformed sphere, and we're mapping that to some other surface, another sphere. Then an isometry means that distances are preserved. A conformal map means that distances aren't preserved, but at least angles are. So if I have a tangent vector and another tangent vector, um, those will map. So if this is the map phi, and I have the vector x and the vector y, then phi maps points of the surface on the left to the surface of the right, right? So V maps a point P to a point V of P. D phi maps tangent vectors to tangent vectors. So here we have D phi of X and D phi of Y. And the map is conformal if the angle on the left equals the angle on the right. Okay, so that's, that's the most, most basic notion of conformal geometry is that those two angles are the same. Okay, there's for little tick marks here. All right, now what we're doing is, that's why we, we talked a lot about that last time, notions of conformal mappings between two abstract surfaces. This time we're gonna look at something a little more specific. 
Um, I remember I showed you last time I had some, uh, some CAD program that I mapped my face onto it. I took a photo of my face, which was a flat image, and I mapped it onto a sphere, and it got all weirdly distorted, and I looked bizarre. Um, please tell me I look bizarre, and that's not how I actually look. But the whole, the whole point was that distances, I look weird because distances are distorted. You can minimize that distortion by at least looking for an angle-preserving map. And this is a really common challenge in computer graphics to do texture mapping, which is exactly what we were trying to do. And in texture mapping, in computer graphics, you're always mapping a flat domain to a curved surface. The texture map itself, the domain of that parameterization, is always something flat. So rather than going from an abstract surface to an abstract surface, we really want to go from some domain in R2, this is R2, to some curved surface in R3. Right? And again, conformal is the same notion of conformal, where if you have tangent vectors to the surface, that maps you to tan sorry, tangent vectors to R2 just look like they're vectors in R2. Tangent vectors to a plane just sit in the same plane. But they map to tangent vectors, vectors that are tangent to the surface on the right, that sit in this tangent plane. And it's conformal if the angle here is the same as the angle here. Now, the algorithm we're going to talk about to create this parameterization actually goes the other way. So the algorithm goes backwards. And I think the idea is once you know how to go backwards, then you just invert it to go forwards. So we're going to take this surface in R3 and map it to two dimensions. And we're going to try to do that in some way that preserves the angles as much as possible. It won't preserve the angles exactly but we literally want to preserve them as much as possible. When you hear those words in mathematics, you should think like lights should flash and you should think this is an optimization problem. Right? When you say as much as possible, it means there's some function and you're looking for the local minima of that function to make it the best possible map. And that's exactly our goal is to find some function that we want to minimize to find the mapping here that distorts angles as little as possible. Okay, so in, in as much as possible, we want angles here to equal angles over here in two dimensions. Okay. All right, so that's the first thing to understand is we're going from three dimensions to two dimensions. All right, next thing to understand is there are um, another way to say that angles are preserved is to say that if you rotate vectors in the picture on the left and then map them over, you get the same thing as if you were to map them over and then rotate them. So this is just an alternate way to view the same thing. So um, I'll try to draw that pictorially. We've got this surface, this curved surface here on the left. We've got um, a tangent plane. We've got a vector in this tangent plane. And now we're going to so let's call this vector v. Now we're going to rotate that vector to a new vector. So I'll call that rotation. Um, and, and specifically, the rotation that we're going to look at is a rotation by 90 degrees. So this rotation, Keenan calls that j. So this is jv. Make that a little neater. JV. So, so j is a rotation by 90 degrees. Okay, and then we have our map. Um, call, keep calling it phi for now, although we're gonna change letters in a minute for the name of the map. Okay, and then we have um, the image of the parameterization. We have d phi of v. So remember, v map, phi maps points to points. d phi maps vectors to vectors. Okay, so that's d phi of v. Now, once I map it over, once I map v over to that two-dimensional domain on the right, now I can rotate it here. And uh, there's no name for this in Keenan's nose, so I'll just call it r for rotation. Okay, so that's um, r of d phi of v. Okay, so what we want is to say that if I rotate and then map over, that's the same thing as mapping it over and rotating because the angles are the same, right? So what we want 
we can sum it up with an equation. If I wrote, if I take V and I rotate it, and then I map that rotated vector over to the right, that gives me the same thing as if I were to have taken V, map it over to the picture on the right, and then rotate it on the right. Got it? Is that okay? Any questions about that? This is like the key equation right here. Because we want this, uh, you know, the, in, in an abstract algebra class, you, you say you want this to be a commutative diagram. You want to say that rotation and mapping is the same thing as mapping and then rotating. And that's just another way to say that the angles on the left are the same as the angles on the right. Uh, do they rotate the same angle in two maps? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's the, that's the point, is if, if this is true, if this condition here is true, then the angle on the, angle on the left has to be the same as the angle on the right. You, just, you don't use J for both, because one of them is a rotation in R3, and the other one's a rotation in, in R2. Yeah. Oh, sorry. But ja I see what you're saying, Jack. So J rotates 90 degrees. R also rotates 90 degrees. And you want a rotation by 90 degrees and then mapping over to be the same thing as mapping over and then rotating by 90 degrees. Yeah, they do rotate. Both R and J rotate by the same number of degrees. And what you want then is for this equation to be true. Yeah. Okay, and so this is like conformal. Like if we have this is conformal, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if this is just an equivalent condition to say the map phi is conformal. So if this is true, then phi is conformal. And it's an equivalency, right? It's, a, and it's an equivalent kind of condition. So it's just another way of saying phi must preserve angles. All right. We're going to rewrite that equation using some stuff we've done before and some stuff we haven't done before. <laughs> um, so let's work on the left side first. So that map J times V. So, um, Sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud here. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, I'm sorry for those of you trying to take notes. I guess I do want to switch to Keenan's notation at this point, and it'll be suggestive. I'll explain why in a minute. So anybody trying to copy this picture, um, Keenan doesn't call his map phi at this point. He switches to the letter Z, and I'll explain why in a minute. So I'm going to change all my fees to Zs. So if you're trying to take notes, sorry, I just drove you crazy. Um, so the name of the map is Z. Okay, so DZ is the map on vectors. Okay. Now let's... Um, Let's look at each side here for a minute. Let's, let's say, what is, why, why the letter Z? And then what is DZ? So we talked earlier in the semester about forms. We spent a long time talking about real valued forms. And let's just keep this specific to one forms right now. So a real valued one form on a surface is just a map from vectors into the real numbers. So you give, you give me a vector, I plug that into my form. You give me a vector at a point. You have to give me both a point and a vector at that point. I plug that into my form omega. So here's my point P, here's my vector V. And what I get is the number omega of V. Okay, it's just a number. Now, later in this semester, we started talking about parameterizations and maps between surfaces. And instead of R-valued forms, we started talking about things like R3-valued forms. So rather than points, so an R3-valued zero form maps a point here on the left to a number in R3. Okay, an R so a point in R3 
and a point over here to another point R3, and a point over here to another point R3. So it's just mapping this surface to some other surface in R3. If you have the set of points that end up there, that would be an R3 valued zero form. The derivative of that would be an R3 valued one form, which would map vectors to vectors. So an R3 valued one form maps vectors in R3 to vectors in R3. That's an R3 valued one form defined on R3. So um, just to confuse everybody, when you say an R3 valued, that means that's the target. And if it's defined on R3, that refers to the domain. Okay. Most of the time when we were doing this, we were looking at R3 valued forms on R2. That means R2 is the domain. The range, the image over here is an R3. And so that's just what we would have called in Calc, regular Calc 3 class, that would, that's just a parameterization. An R3 valued zero form on R2 is just a parameterization. It means that at every point in R2, we get a point in R3. And then the derivative of that would be take vectors here to vectors over here. Could you repeat which one is the domain and which one is the range again, please? Yes, they're color coded here. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah. All right, we're gonna take this one step further, okay? And then that's gonna allow us to rewrite this, this equation right here. So we want this picture. We want a picture that takes some sort of three-dimensional object to something that looks like it has two real dimensions, but we're gonna do this in a way so that it's easy to write down this rotation map. And um, an easy way to write down a rotation map on a plane is to stop thinking about that plane as having two real dimensions and to start thinking about that plane as having one complex dimension. So rather than mapping R3, to R2, oops, rather than doing that, we're gonna map it to what's written as C1, one dimensional complex numbers. Okay, now one dimensional complex numbers look to your eyeball like they're two dimensional. So a single complex number looks like A plus BI. I think you've all had enough math that you've seen i before, squared to negative one, and hopefully you've seen the complex plane before. And the way you draw the number a plus b i, you draw the real number a by drawing a line and finding the location of the number a on that line. You draw the complex number a plus b i by drawing a plane. You have the real axis, the imaginary axis. The real axis are um, is where you put the A, and the imaginary axis is where you put the B, and the number A plus BI is right there. It's just a single point in that plane. So it's one dimensional in the sense that it takes one number, but that number happens to be complex. And a complex number has two parts of it, so that's why it looks to your brain like it's two dimensional. But mathematically, it's one dimensional, but it's one complex dimension. <laughs> It's a little hard to get your head around. The word dimension just refers to the number of numbers you have to specify to determine a point. In this case, we only have to specify one number, so it's one dimensional, but the number we're specifying is a complex number, which we draw on a plane. Am I beating a dead horse here? I think I am. <laughs> okay, so rather than looking at um, R2, sorry, rather than looking at R2, two valued forms on R3. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna look at complex valued forms on R3. So a complex valued form maps 
points in R3, a zero form just maps a point in R3 to a point in complex space. And for some reason, I don't know what, but most complex variables textbooks use the letter Z to represent a complex number, which is why we're calling this map Z. So Z of P is a complex number. If this is a point P, then this point might be Z of P. It's just some complex number that depends on this point in R3. Okay, now the derivative of that is a complex valued one form that takes tangent vectors in R3 to tangent vectors to the complex plane, which are one complex dimensional vectors. To your eye, that'll look like it's a two dimensional real vector. So if this is the vector V in R3, then this is the vector DZ of V. So maybe I should give you an example first. Keenan does zero examples. So let's look at an example of a complex valued form. So I'm gonna do this slightly easier. So here, this would be a C1 valued form, zero form, on just on R2. So I'm starting here in R2, where I have X and Y, and I'm gonna map that to C1. Okay, so it's just a zero form. So I'll just, I'm just gonna make something up off the top of my head. Um, uh, so this map Z is um, X squared plus Y squared plus I times XY. Okay, the point is that it takes a point here which is determined by numbers X and Y. R2 means it's determined by two real numbers. And what you get out is a single complex number, that's just one number, which we would plot as a point in a plane. Right, so it looks like it's taking point in a plane to a point in a plane, but it's really taking two real numbers and giving us one complex number. Does that make sense? I hope that's helping. Right, that's just a single number on the right. It's not a vector, it's just a complex number, right? And then DZ, so how does this work? It's gonna be, um, if you want the derivative of any function, any zero form, it's the same thing. It's the partial of Z with respect to X DX plus the partial of Z with respect to Y DY, okay? Um, so that's, uh, what is it? 2x, 2x plus iy dx, okay, plus, now the partial respect to y is 2y plus ix dy. All right, now, again, one form, so this is a one form. This is a zero form. This is a one form. So a one form, a zero form, and a complex valued zero form just takes things on the left and gives you complex numbers. A complex valued one form just takes vectors on the left and gives you, again, just a single complex number on the right. But we're gonna draw that complex number as a vector. So how does that work? Well. Let's, for example, let's say I have the vector at the point one, one, and it's the vector zero, two. So I have the vector zero, two at the point one, one. Okay, well, one, one, those are the values of X and Y. And zero, two, those are the values of DX and DY. And so if you just crank this through, we get uh, two plus i times zero plus two plus i times two, which is just four plus two i, which I'm gonna draw as a vector, which looks like four over and two up. 
that's four plus two i at the point z of one one. So this would be the point z of one one, and this is the vector four plus two i. It just that vector just looks like a single complex number, right? But we draw it looking like a two dimensional vector because it's got two p a real part and an imaginary part. So again, the point on the right is a single complex number, and the vector on the right is a single complex number. But to your eyeball, it just looks like a two-dimensional point and a two-dimensional vector. I hope this is helping. <laughs> this, is all, this is all, it's like, I remember the first time I saw complex numbers. And honestly, this class is the first time I ever saw complex-valued forms. So um, I'm going to keep going here. And why the hell did we do all this? The only reason I can tell to do all this is because it's going to let us write down this map here, this map really easy. The thing on the right, dz of v, that's just a complex number that we're drawing as a vector. Right? dz of v, that's just a complex number, but we're drawing it as a vector. And now I have to know how do I rotate a complex number by 90 degrees in the complex plane. And that's super easy. Then may know, if I have a complex number, how you rotate it 90 degrees? Some of you have taken complex variables. You just have to multiply it by i again, is that right? What's that, Morgan? Say it again. Do you just multiply by i? That's it, yep. You just multiply by i. So this equation on the right, Instead of writing R dz, I'm going to write that I dz. So dz is a complex number. dz of e is a complex number. And if I multiply that complex number by the, the imaginary number square root of negative 1, I, that has the effect of a 90 degree rotation. So dz of e is a complex number. We're drawing that as a vector i times that complex number, if we draw that as a vector, then it just looks like we've rotated it by 90 degrees. Okay, all right. That's the right-hand side of this equation. The left-hand side, we're also gonna re rewrite that map j. And this we did before. If I take a one form and apply it to, sorry, if I take a vector and rotate it 90 degrees, and apply some one form to it, that's exactly the definition of the Hodge star of that one form applied to the original vector. That's all the Hodge star does on one forms is it just rotates them 90 degrees. So this whole equation we can rewrite in a very different form. I'm going to rewrite it down here, all the way down here at the bottom. It's now the equation um, dz of v hodge star equals i times dz of v. So what's happening on the left side is we're looking at the one form defined on v, which is the same as the one form rotated 90 degrees defined on v. That's the same as just rotating v by 90 degrees first and applying the original one form. Okay, so on the left, that star looks like it's happening on the outside, but you should don't think of it as applying dz and then starring it. Star dz is a different one form. Star dz is one thing. And what star dz does is it rotates the vector and applies dz to it. So star dz, the first thing it does is rotate the vector. So on the left, we're rotating the vector first and then applying the map dz. On the right, that i is on the outside of things should think of this with parentheses around it. We're taking the vector v, plugging it into the map dz, that sends it over to the right side, multiplying by i, that has the effect of rotating 90 degrees. Okay. If you were to write this out in coordinates, if you write everything as a plus bi, and then understand what effect this equation has on the real parts and the imaginary parts, you actually end up with two equations. You get a constraint on the real part and a constraint on the imaginary part. And those two equations, those are called the cauchy riemann equations. OK, 
Okay, but really what's going on here is just the equation on the left says, rotate your vector and map it over. And the equation on the right says, map it over and then rotate. And we're saying it has to be conformal if you get the same answer. All right, now we want to find the map that's as conformal as possible. So it's conformal if the left side equals the right side. If the left side does, for some reason we can't find that, we want to make the left side as close as possible to the right side. So whenever you have an equation and you want the left side to be as close as possible to the right side, you just subtract them and try to minimize the difference. Okay, so our goal then is to minimize, well, let me, let me back up. It's to find, so we want to find this map Z. We don't know what Z is. We want to find this mapping so that star dz of v minus i dz of v is as small as possible. Right? If it were zero, if we can make it zero, then we've found a conformal map and we know the angles are preserved. Maybe we were never gonna be able to find a conformal map, but we wanna find something as conformal as possible, where the angles are as little distorted as possible. Right? So Z is the name of this mapping. and We wanna find a map where the distortion is as small as possible, which means the left side is as close as possible to the right side. All right, now to say as small as possible, we're almost there. The problem is that this thing is not a real number. So everything we learned in Calc 3 about finding minima of functions only works if they're real valued functions. So we need to minimize this quantity, but this quantity isn't giving us a real number, it's giving us complex numbers. So we have to somehow take this quantity that I've circled and turn it into a real number and minimize that real number. So we need to define some norm on this. Sorry, I'm cheating and looking at Keenan's notes while I talk, make sure that I'm not totally off base. Yes, we need to find some norm on this, some measure of how big this is. So we want to find some way to measure star dz of v minus i dz of v. And we're gonna minimize that. So that's just some way to measure that and turn, convert it into a real number. If that real number we get is zero, it means those two things are equal, right? So we have to understand how to do this. Um, for some technical reasons, whenever you minimize a real valued function, a positive real valued function, um, it's often easier to minimize its square. So just for arithmetic purposes, we're actually gonna minimize the square of that real number. That also keeps it always non-zero. Right? You don't wanna minimize something that can go negative because otherwise it'll just keep going down, 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 down forever. You wanna minimize something that's always non-negative and then the smallest value will be zero. So it makes sense to square that thing and you wanna minimize its square. And then the arithmetic will have worked out nicer if we put a one fourth in front. There's no real reason for that one fourth other than and to make the arithmetic easier later, All right? And this is called the conformal energy. So the energy, and it depends on the map Z that we pick, and we use a little subscript C to indicate the conformal energy. So this is called the conformal energy. So the map Z has this conformal energy which is just a measure of how far that map is from being conformal. And again, if the map were exactly conformal, this energy would be zero, which means this thing is zero, which means these two things are equal to each other, which means rotating vectors on the left is the same as rotating vectors on the right, which means angles on the left are the same as angles on the right. I'm just trying to tie all these ideas back to the earlier definitions. 
All right, we good so far? So I haven't told you what this norm is yet. Like what, what do those bars mean? I haven't told you that yet. Just some way to measure that difference that's gonna give us a real number. Steve, I had a question. Yeah. Um, this is going back a little bit, but um, can you say the sentence that you said one more time about how star of dz of v is the same as applying star to v and then piping it through dz? I think I'm just in like linear algebra land in my head and- Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's just the definition of the Hodge star. Okay. Is that these, circle. The definition of the, of the Hodge star is just defined to be these two things are equal. Okay. Right, it's just if I rotate and then map by a one form, the, the, the value of the Hodge star of a one form is just defined to be take the vector, rotate it, and apply the one form. And that's how we define the Hodge star. Just for, just, think, it's just yeah, works for one form. No, 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 totally. I, I think in my head, like, I usually just think about the Jacobian and the star as being the same when applied to vectors. Like, I think about, like, I would be very happy to write that dz star v, but if star, star takes one forms to one forms, right. then you have to apply the star to a one, <laughs> the V is a vector, not a one form. And I think yeah. that's a, in the discretization, like you always, I always think of one forms and vectors as somehow being like the same, even though they're not. Yeah, well, they're dual to each other. So yeah. <laughs> they kind of are the same and they're kind of not the same. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, uh, this Hodge star equation only works on uh, R2 that with a yeah. vector, right? It only works on one forms in, in R2, yeah. So we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're just constrained to this, this tangent plane here. And in that tangent plane, we, you rotate 90 degrees. Yeah. All right, cool, thanks. Yep. All right, so we're gonna tell you what this norm is. So somehow we wanna take the norm of, well, well, first of all, I mean, yeah. So we're, we're looking at the map. Um, so if, if, I, if I don't worry about what vector it is, I can think of it on the level of forms. Um, this is the form star dz, and I'm gonna subtract the form i dz, right? You can think of that as one object that we feed a vector v into. And this thing is a complex valued one form. And uh, on, and it's going to be defined on this surface S in R3. Okay, so again, going back up to the picture, I won't, I won't go, I won't scroll back up. We've got this surface in R3, which now I'm calling S, and it maps to the complex plane. And that's Z. And then this thing is a one form, is another complex valued one form defined on this surface. So it takes tangent vectors to the surface and gives us vectors, tangent vectors to the complex plane. So let's call this thing omega. This is a this is a complex valued one form. So Omega, I'll just rewrite it as star dz minus i dz. It's a complex valued one form on the surface. And I want to know how do I measure a complex valued one form? How do I get a single number out of a complex valued one form defined on a surface? And um, here's the definition we're going to use it's going to be the integral over the surface. I integrate over the surface with respect to area, um, uh, let me make sure I get this right. I'm gonna cheat the, uh, it's, I, I'm gonna write down what Keenan writes down. It's not, it's not that important that you understand this, but I'm gonna write it down. So I take this one form omega and I look at 
and it's complex conjugate. So I make the imaginary part negative and negate the imaginary part. That gives me a different one form. I take the Hodge star of that one form. I wedge that with the original one form. Now that gives me a complex valued two form. And a two form is something I can integrate with respect to area. I integrate that two form over the whole surface. And that gives me just a number. You integrate a two form over a surface that gives me a number. Now, this should look a lot to you like um, Yeah, this should, sorry, I'm cheating a little bit, making sure, I just keep looking back enough to make sure I'm not saying gibberish here. This should look a lot to you like um, uh, what happens when we just take a complex number. Let's say we just had a complex number. We take its complex conjugate and multiply it by another complex number, by its, sorry, by itself. So that's just a minus bi times a plus bi. And that's a squared plus abi minus abi minus i squared b squared, right? But i squared is negative one and these cancel. So that's just a squared plus b squared. And that's a non-negative real number. Right, this is a non-negative real number. And the point is this is something very, very similar at each point. We're just taking the conjugate of a real number, of a complex number, multiplying it by that complex number. And that gives us a real number and then we're gonna integrate those real numbers over the whole surface. So even though that equation looks a little bit complicated, don't worry about getting your head around it. Basically, we're just at every point, we're just taking a complex number multiplying it by its conjugate to give us a real number, and then integrating those real numbers over the whole surface to get some measure of what this thing is doing over the whole surface. Okay, so the point is, this is a real number. This is a non-negative. Could you say again why is there a Hodge star there? Uh, because otherwise, um, if I don't, if you don't Hodge star it, then we're just doing omega bar wedge omega, and that'll be zero. Remember, you got to remember what, um, what. Oh, right, right, totally, yeah. I think that'll be zero. Again, if you ask me too many technical questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I think, I think if you don't have the Hodge star, you get zero. But actually, I, I'm only about seventy percent sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it makes sense. It's intuitively true. Certainly omega wedge omega gives you zero. I think omega bar wedge omega also gives you zero, but I'm not completely sure. Wait, so I'm, I'm trying to think about omega as like living in the complex plane. So yeah. when you take the complex conjugate, the you're basically like reflecting over the real axis, right? But then mm -hmm. when you apply the Hodge star to that, don't you rotate it? 90 degrees, yeah. You basically rotate it 90 degrees. And so then you're going to end up with something whose magnitude is. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's work through the geometry. So. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, this is the picture I'm trying to think of. Then we rotate this 90 degrees. Oh, it ensures that it's it's always a, a two form and not degenerate to zero. Because if omega yeah. was aligned with the real axis, then yep. the complex conjugate would be the same as itself. Yep. That's um, right. That's and right. and then rotating it by 90 degrees would ensure that you span R2. That's right. Okay. Yep. So omega wedge. Ooh. The area of this thing is, is star omega bar wedge omega. Yeah. Yep. And that's right. If you start, if omega were just real, if we were pointing out there horizontally on the real axis and we didn't star it, then um, omega and omega bar would be the same thing and we'd get zero for that area. That's right. 
And the same thing, if it was purely imaginary, you would reflect it around the, yep. if you just did the conjugate, then you would end up with a yep. vector in the negative of itself, which would also yep. spend zero. Okay. Yep. Okay, I feel better now. Yep. Jack, did that answer your question? It's a, good, it's a nice picture. Yeah, yeah, it looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay, yeah, so that's good. Now we're understanding this a little bit better. Right, so it's a way to get us a real number out of this. All right, so we want to apply that to this particular one form. So we're going to do, oh boy, so how are we going to do this? I'm just going to put it all together. Um, here, let me erase this stuff. Okay, made some space here. All right, so that means that the magnitude of this, um, of omega, which is our conformal energy, right? Uh, sorry, no, the conformal energy is this, right? Uh, magnitude of omega. If I put this, these two things together, I get the integral over S of, oh boy, the star of Omega bar, so omega is star dz minus i dz bar <laughs> wedge, the same thing, star dz minus i dz. And all of that I'm going to integrate over the surface. Okay, now um, the beautiful thing about this is that a lot of things commute. The stars commute, this star on the outside, and it distribute. So this star on the outside distributes, and star star is just the original thing. Star cancels with the Hodge star of the Hodge star. It's just nothing, right? Um, or it's the negative. Sorry, star star of dz gives you negative dz, because star is rotating 90 degrees. If I rotate another 90 degrees, I get the negative of the original, right? Um, star of i dz, well i is just a constant. You then pull constants out of the Hodge star. So there's a lot of work you do. Um, the wedge is acting kind of like multiplication. You can foil the left side and the right side. So you can distribute, you can distribute the conjugate. The conjugate of the sum or difference of two quantities is just the difference of the conjugates. So I, I, it will take too long to write all this out. But you can write this out and you'll get four different terms, just like when you foil out, you get a first, outside, inside, last. So we can get four different wedge products here and they'll all simplify. And um, what you end up, I'm just gonna give you the bottom line. And this is actually one of the written exercises and I encourage you to do it. It doesn't take that long. Um, the only tricky part I found is that one of the terms was looked like something like star DZ bar wedge star dz. That was one of the four terms that I got. And um, it took me a while to realize that that's just dz bar wedge dz. And um, the reason is because if I take two vectors and I compute the area of the parallelogram between them, that's going to be the same as the areas if I rotate both 90 degrees and compute the area of the parallelogram between them. All right, so the stars just rotate things 90 degrees. So if you rotate both compute area, that's the same thing as not rotating either and computing the area. So you can, you can remove the stars when you have a star on both terms. So that's just a hint. So um, the bottom line when you do all of this is you get um, one of the terms is minus i over two times the integral over our surface dz bar wedge dz. That's one of the terms. And the other terms are uh, one more. Let's see if I get this right. Hold on. The other term is one half 
times the integral over s of, ah, this is going to be crazy, um, the Laplacian of z, <gasps> yep, wedged z, uh, sorry, the star of the Laplacian, all right, yeah, I guess that's right, da, something like that. This, this quantity, it doesn't look like it, but this quantity came up before in the last chapter. I never mentioned it in class, but it came up before. Um, and it came up in the exercise some of you did on the Green's functions. So if you work through the exercises, all of this, by the way, I'm kind of summarizing the results of exercises 7.5, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8. And 7 the final results here, this is called the Dirichlet energy. And this, one of the exercises, is the second term there, is just the area of the surface, complex valued area of the surface. Actually, I think it's real valued. I think that's just the area of the surface. The total signed area, it's signed, sorry, it might be positive or negative. Okay, so that's the result here is that the conformal energy of Z turns out to be the Dirichlet energy, which involves the Laplacian, minus the area. So this is, a, this is the upshot of exercise 7.8. So even if you just spaced out for the last 15 minutes, let me just tell you where we were 15 minutes ago and where we are now. So 15 minutes ago, we got the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which were here. Hopefully, I hope you all followed me to there. If we just take the difference, I hope I convince you that we want to minimize this thing by taking the difference of those two sides. Minimizing that involved turning it into some energy that we minimize, and then using the definition of that energy and a bunch of just algebra involving forms and complex numbers and Hodge stars, we end up with this. Okay. So if I lost you, just you can do the exercise in your own time or just take my word for it or take Keenan's word for it, that somehow it all simplifies into the difference of these two quantities. One of those is the Dirichlet energy. One of those is the area. Now, to minimize the Dirichlet energy, that happens when the Laplacian is zero. So we're going, this is tying us back into the last chapter where we're going to need to know the Laplacian to write down this thing, okay? And the area, we're gonna discretize this integral to get the area. Just gonna be a summation, and it turns out to be an easy summation to get that area, okay? Wait, the Dirichlet energy is minimized when the Laplacian is zero. zero? Yeah. So we can think of that as being, um, like when the curve, the mean curvature every, like basically when the surface is not undergoing relaxation in the projection to the image. Yeah. Um, I think oh, I, I think that's, this like that's gotta be right. Yeah, I'm not sure what the right way to visualize this. Yeah. Because we're taking the Laplacian now as a complex valued function. So the pictures we had in our head before have to be modified a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know the right picture. Yeah, maybe that's not right then. Yeah, okay. Can you say again what this area is? Yeah, it's literally just the area of the surface. Oh, it's the area of the image. Sorry, this is the area of the, uh, yeah, of the image of the, remember we're mapping a three-dimensional thing to a two-dimensional thing. and this is A of Z. It's the area of that two-dimensional thing on the right. So is the way to think about this as the, you know, we're looking at the difference between these terms and we want those two terms in some way to balance each other out. Yeah. And so the, I, I think what's really fascinating about this is that, you know, when we talked about isometries, we were talking about preserving lengths. So 
But when we're talking about conformal geometry, we're talking about preserving areas in some way. Um, and it, it feels like that should be the same thing, but it's, it's not that actually somehow preserving the area of the surface under this mapping is not pre preserving lengths, it's pre preserving angles. Yeah, that's right. Which yeah. is, which is, I don't know, I, I still find that surprising. I do too. Yeah, it's all very mysterious to me as well. <laughs> um, I have a question about the uh, hot star when we were doing like the uh, Cauchy-Riemann equations. I think. Yeah. Um. So, w when I sort of like envision um, complex surfaces, you know, you could visualize them two dimensionally, but like from a strictly like just linear algebra perspective, if you have like a vector vector space over the complex numbers just like a one dimensional one is it, it'll have, you know, I and the real axis, but it'll still be like one dimensional, right? Yeah. So, um, I'm curious as to why our Hodge star isn't behaving as if it's like one dimensional, like, like, like the, the definition of Hodge star is like you take, you know, you've got some form wedged with the Hodge star that form gives you back all of the orthogonal bases like wedged together, right? Yeah, but this is just in that tangent plane. Yes, we're just looking at the tangent planes to the surface. So, so isn't plane. that tangent plane like one dimensional? Like it just has a yeah. complex number associated with it? In the domain, it's two dimensional, right? We're over here. So the Hodge star of DZ is going to be, right? If I have, if this is a vector here, then the Hodge star that gives me something over here. Um, Okay, so maybe my confusion is a bit deeper than like so we're we're applying it after the D operator, right? So oh, the star D Z is one thing to find on the domain. Okay. It's not like you take Z and then take D of it and then you take star of that. Star That's D how I was envisioning it. Yeah, star um, think of think of there's like parentheses here. Star D Z is a is a form defined on the domain. Like and this. yeah. It, and it okay. has the effect of rotating the vectors on the domain first before you map them over. Okay. Okay, so then, then this, this equation makes a ton more sense then as yeah. to why we want those two to match up. Yeah. Cool. All right, now, here's the problem with all this. <laughs> so Keenan points out that the problem is that if I'm mapping this three-dimensional thing to this two-dimensional thing, and I try to minimize this conformal distortion, this conformal energy, then um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna adjust this map Z to make the energy smaller and smaller and smaller. And what will happen as I do that, if I don't have any constraints at all, is that I'll start to watch this thing kind of shrink down to nothing. It'll just disappear because the energy gets better and better and better as it gets close, as the whole thing gets closer and closer and closer to a point. Okay, so we need some additional constraints before we try to optimize. This is going to be an optimization problem subject to certain constraints. Right, so again, this is something hopefully you did in a Calc 3 class where you had a multivariable function and you had a constraint and you look for the minimum of that function subject to that constraint. Okay, um, and I'll remind you how you did that. Hopefully you studied something called Lagrange multipliers and they're gonna rear their ugly heads here. Okay. Um, so the constraint is just basically gonna be that we want this area to be one. We're gonna look for the minimum possible um, energy subject to the constraint that the area on the right is one. We're just gonna fix it at one. And also, we don't want it to kind of wander off. So we're not only going to make sure it's one, but we're going to insist that it remains centered at the origin. So the average value should be right there at the origin. So we want this thing to have area one centered at the origin. So there's actually two constraints. We want to minimize the conformal energy subject to the area equals one and it also being centered 
So, this is, so we'll talk about how to mathematize both those constraints. Okay. Um, and when I say area here, I'm being a little bit vague on what I mean by area, and we'll talk about that too. Okay. All right. Um, the nice thing about this is you're going to rewrite this as a matrix. If you kind of follow the instructions there, and let's call that matrix A, because that's what Keenan calls it. So um, unfortunately, he has this kind of script A for area, and then a cap big capital Roman A for the matrix that's going to represent this operator. And so um, we're going to find this matrix A so that the conformal energy is, now I'm going to write something that's going to look funny, Z, H, A, Z. So A is going to be a symmetric And he gives it away in the notes. He says, that matrix A, it's just a Laplace operator you did in the previous chapter. It's really the same thing. Okay. Now, what's that ZHAZ? Um, ZH, that stands for the Hermitian of Z. And you should think of that like a complex value of the transpose. So, so let me just take a brief pause here. If I have, um, if I just want to write the inner product between the vector, um, let's say V is the vector A, B, C. Uh, sorry. I usually write vectors vertically. So V is the vector A, B, C. If I want to write V dot V, then um, what I want is actually the matrix product of the three by one matrix ABC times the one by three matrix ABC. And another way to write that is it's V transpose times V. Another way to write dot product is to use the transpose and use matrix multiplication. Okay, now I can mess with dot products. We talked last time about Ramanian metrics. This is something called a bilinear form. It's a, just a, a way to generalize the idea of a dot product. Let's say I wanted the result. So, so the result here is going to be a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Let's say I wanted to mess with this and I wanted to get four a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Kind of weight that first component differently. So I could do that by sticking a different matrix in right here. So I can look at the product a, b, c times um, 4, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 times A, B, C. Okay, and what that 4 does is it ends up right there. It's just a way, especially if you think of this matrix as being a diagonal matrix, then the entries of the diagonal are a way to reweight the summands in the, in, a, in, the, in the usual dot product to make more weight to the first component versus the second component, okay? So I'll call this matrix M. So now we're looking at V transpose M V. Got it? All right. Um, and that's just gonna give us some real number, right? Which is something like a dot product. It's called a, a bilinear form. It's a symmetric product. Okay. If I want to do that with complex valued things, then not only will I look at the transpose, but I'm also going to look at the conjugate of the first one. If I look at the conjugate of the transpose, then I get a real number out. If, if all the entries of V are complex valued, then I'm essentially multiplying each number times its complex conjugate may be weighted by something else if M is just some matrix. And this thing is just shorthand for the, this H is shorthand for that, okay? So when you see that H, 
just think that's basically just the transpose, but we had to take the complex, the conjugate because everything's complex. All right, now the point is that this conformal energy, we're gonna be able to write as the transpose, the conjugate transpose times some matrix times Z. That's another way to rewrite that is to use this little H, it's just a shorthand. So how do we minimize something of this form? Um, and the answer is the same as just in real numbers. How would you minimize something of, uh, oh, I've erased it. This was V transpose MV. How would I minimize something that looks like that? If I know what the matrix M is, it's just a matrix of constants. What is the minimal value of V transpose MV? And that's surprising. <laughs> minimum of V transpose MV is exactly just um, MV. What do I mean by that? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. That's not right. I apologize. Not the minimum. I want to minimize it among, I want to think about all the different directions I could go from a fixed vector V and ask what is the direction where V transpose MV decreases the smallest or the biggest. And I have another name for that. That's the gradient. It's the gradient. The gradient of that real valued function is just M times V. Okay, now remember, this is what we want to do. If I want to minimize some function, I see I'm out of time here. So we, we will finish up next time. If I have this function here, and I want to minimize it, remember how you minimize something, a, a multivariable function in Calc 3, is you take its gradient and do great, what's called gradient descent. You, go, you travel in the direction of the gradient, and that, that'll actually take you to a local maximum. If we travel in the direction of the negative gradient, we'll go to a local minimum. Okay, so we're going to want the negative gradient of Z, H, A, Z, where A, where A is this matrix we're going to calculate. And that's going to be just, um, it's just A, Z. I can, I can show you how to do this next time. That's actually not so hard. It's just an easy limit calculation from just at the level of Calc 1. It's a super easy calculation to show that. All right, one, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go three minutes over time, okay, and do one more thing, um, which is we want to minimize something subject to a constraint. Right, and our constraint is that we have this fixed overall area. Now the way we're gonna write that overall area is by using the mass matrix that we did last time. So the area that we wanna fix at one is gonna be given by um, ZH times BZ, where B, I'm just using Keenan's letters here, B was the mass matrix that we did last time. So we look at the dual areas of all the vertices on the surface and um, the mass matrix is just a diagonal matrix with those dual areas on there, okay? Now, if I wanna minimize one function with respect to another function and that other function I'm fixing at a value, this is exactly the method of Lagrange multiplier. So I'll just remind you how that works and just leave you with the final equation we get, and then I'll try to explain it better next time and talk about how that leads us to an algorithm that you can code up next time. I don't think I'm gonna talk the whole time next time because I'm we're really almost done. But um, just the, the picture is, let's say I have a function, 
just a function of two variables. Okay. Um, so let's got some local. So let's look at the level curves of this function. Okay. And then I also have some constraint g of x comma y equals one. So I have two functions here. One is the constraint function. One is the function I'm trying to minimize. But I, I'm going to draw this implicit, implicitly defined thing. So g of x, y equals one. That means we're on that curve. Okay. Well, if we remember our Calc 3, which very few people ever do, what it means is that the level curves of F have to be tangent to the level curves of G at that point where F is minimized subject to that constraint, which means a vector perpendicular to the level curve of F is some scalar multiple to a vector perpendicular to the level curve of G. And the way you get a vector perpendicular to a level curve is by looking at its gradient. So this is saying, telling us the gradient of F is some scalar multiple of the gradient of G. Okay. Well, all right. So one more time. I'm trying to minimize this thing. I'm trying to minimize, sorry, minimize F subject to this constraint G. Okay, well, really what I want to do is I want to minimize um, the conformal energy. Subject to this constraint, z h b z equals one, right? And so I have to look at the gradient of the conformal energy. So now if I look at this, the gradient of the conformal energy equals some multiple of z h b z. So I have the gradient of that. That means, but the gradient of this thing is just a z, and the gradient of this thing is just b z. Lambda is a constant, so another way to say that is um, lambda is a constant. So I could bring the lambda inside. I could rewrite that as a z equals b lambda z. And now, if I hit both sides with b inverse, I can look at b inverse a z equals lambda z. And another way to say that is that lambda is an eigenvalue of b inverse a. All right, I just said a whole lot of stuff. I said it really quickly. It was super confusing even to me and I was saying it. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna very quickly summarize and then I'll repeat some of this stuff next time. And then we'll push this a little further to create an algorithm. And we're almost there, we're really close because this is all we need at this point to actually create the algorithm is to discretize this, okay? So again, here's where we're at. I'm just gonna to try to talk you through it real quick. So we're conformal if we preserve angles. If we preserve angles, we get this equation right here. And if we think of the right side of the picture as being in the complex plane, the right side of the picture is here. If we think of that as being in the complex plane, then that equation turns into the cauchy riemann equation, which is right here. There's the cauchy riemann equation, okay? We want this to be as conformal as possible, so I'm gonna subtract the right side from the left side and try to minimize this quantity. But for, to say minimize the quantity, that means I have to some, have some way to measure that quantity, which is exactly what the conformal energy is. I minimize that quantity, that's the conformal energy. Okay, minimizing, now rewriting that conformal energy, I, it ends up being, 
after all this work and all this algebra, you can end up rewriting that as the Dirichlet energy minus the area. And if you think a little bit more, that's just written by ZH a Z, where A is the Laplacian operator you all built last time. Okay. Now again, we have this issue that if we just minimize A, uh, the conformal energy, then the right side may just shrink, the right side of this picture may just shrink to nothing. So we had to impose this extra constraint so now we're doing a minimization problem with a constraint. We remember Lagrange multipliers. Lagrange multipliers say, oh, if you minimize one function with respect to this constraint, really what you want to do is make sure the gradient of the first function is some multiple of the gradient of the second function. So we're minimizing the conformal energy with respect to this constraint function. So we want the gradient of the conformal energy to be some multiple of the gradient of the constraint function. Uh oh. Um, no, no. I think we lost the screen. We did. We're back. Hold on. Oh, it's my internet. There I was at the very end. Oh. Are we back? No. Oh well, we end up with, I'll just talk it through. Ah, uh, shoot. That's not gonna work either. Well, what we end up with is that this this simple equation that the mass matrix, the inverse of the matrix, matrix times A, um, what we're looking for are eigenvalues of eigenvectors of the inverse of the mass matrix times the Laplace matrix. Again, I'll review this next time, and then we'll turn this into an algorithm, and hopefully um, all the confusion that I created today I can clear up next time, because I know I can create confusion for every one of you today. Um, cause I know I did for me. <laughs> All right. So let's stop there. Next time I'll pick up there. We'll probably go for about 20 minutes next time and then answer homework questions. And between now and next time we'll post what the homework actually is. And, uh, you can start taking a look at that. And in the meantime, um, what you should do is read chapter seven of Keenan's notes and see if anything I said is, will make sense now or vice versa, see if his notes will make sense now, now that you've sat through me babbling for a while. Okay. All right. See you all Thursday. See you then. Bye.